Today, we are debunking three of the most common myths about Ayn Rand. This is New Idea Live, the podcast of the Ayn Rand Institute, and with me is Mike Maza. So, Mike, let's start straight away with my favorite myth. Ayn Rand hated the poor. So the reason we chose these myths is because they're quite widespread and also because supposedly serious intellectuals, serious people are actually believing and reproducing these myths. So here's how the leading uh, British intellectual, George Monbiot, characterized Ayn Rand's ideas a few years ago. Quote, so Ayn, for Ayn Rand, quote, the poor deserve to die and the rich deserve unmediated power. Get that. The poor deserve to die. The rich deserve unmediated power. I remember a couple of years ago on Twitter, someone reproduced this myth, Ayn Rand hated the poor. So I gave them this challenge. Find me one line somewhere in the so many books that Ayn Rand has written. Find me one line where you draw the conclusion that she hates the poor. And I will give, uh, for every time you find this in her work, I give 100 uh, euros to any charity you want. Of course, I got no answer. But someone might say, okay, Ayn Rand didn't openly said she hated the poor, but maybe if we look at her work, we will see that in her novels, the poor are presented as deserving nothing and as being, uh, as George Momio says, deserving to die. So let's see how Ayn Rand portrays quote, the poor in her novels. So let's start with the Fountainhead. So the hero, Howard Rourke, is born into poverty. His father is a manual laborer. His father dies early. So Rourke becomes a manual laborer from a very young age. He works in construction. He works through his years at the university. And in his mid-20s, he's still very, very poor because of the, uh, his work is very innovative, not many people appreciate it, so he's very poor. And at some point, he chooses to go and work in a quarry, again, one of the most difficult manual labors. He leaves behind architecture for some period because he prefers doing an honest job that will keep him, though, re relatively poor, rather than compromise his principles. So already here, if for the biggest part of the novel, the hero is poor, we should question this idea that Ayn Rand hated the poor. But here are some more evidence from the Fountainhead that show what a ridiculous statement this is that Ayn Rand hated the poor. So, who are Howard Rourke's, again, the main hero's friends? One of his best friends is Mike, someone who has spent his whole life being a construction worker. And one of his other very close friends is an artist who I can only describe him, at least for the first part of the novel, as a starving artist. So how can it be that you hate the poor, but not only your hero is relatively poor, but also his friends are definitely not rich. They are uh, manual laborers or poor. Or what about this thing? At some point, our hero, Rourke, finds himself in a trial and he has to pick a jury. Who does he pick as the people on the judgment of whom he will place his faith? The, 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 listen, the lineup of the jury. 50% of them are, quote, a truck driver, a bricklayer, an electrician, a gardener, and three factory workers. So half of the jury in Rourke's trial are quote-unquote poor. And again, we are told to believe that Ayn Rand hated the poor. And just a few words about Atlas Rank before I get to you, Mike. In Atlas Rank, we see the same pattern. Many of the heroes start being quite poor. Hank Reardon is an example. But also, there is this very captivating scene where the rich, the rich executive, Dagny Taggart, she has her own, uh, her, her own car in the train, her own coach in the train. And as she walks around the train, she notices a poor uh, Trump, someone who is homeless, and the train conductor is about to throw him off the train. Now, this person is as poor as it gets. He's homeless, and his whole property fits in a bag. And Dagny looks at him with sympathy, 
she stops the conductor from throwing him off the train. She invites him to her coach to dine with him. And she tells him, look, tell me your story, uh, what happened. And she listens with respect because she sees that this guy has dignity, that this guy is someone who wants to work, but just the way things are, for some reasons, he ended up poor. And actually, within some hours, she gives him a job. So looking in the novels, not only I don't see any evidence that Ayn Rand, quote, hated the poor, I see evidence to the contrary, Mike. And I think, Nikos, it's worth pointing out, too, that for part of her life, Rand herself was poor. So she was an immigrant from Russia, came over with almost nothing, and didn't make it as a writer until late later in life. So the plausibility of the of the charge is, uh, I think, non-existent. I mean, it, we you kind of tallied rich, poor characters in the novels, um, as we'll talk about uh, in the next uh, smear most of the villains or many of the villains are actually rich. Um, and the, in the novels, the poor are depicted as good or neutral, sometimes as victims. Um, so the charge really isn't concerned with what's true. I mean, the reason to go into these facts isn't so much to show that it's false, but to just show that if you really wanted to form an opinion on Rand and her view of wealth, her view of, um, you know, social hierarchies or whatever, you couldn't plausibly think that this was true. So it's just a classic smear. And the reason to go into all these different examples and the different facts is not to, again, not to show that it's false because it's a charge made without any attempt to, to justify itself. It's to show that what's going on is that this is, uh, this is just a smear. This is just a, uh, slander against her, um, you know, to, I think to in, intimidate people uh, away from taking her seriously. And the reason that the this kind of smear, I think, has some purchase, especially amongst sort of leftish types who George Moin, Moinbot, I, how do you say his name? Uh, George Monbiot. He's a, Monbiot, yeah. He's a, he's a left wing intellectual. You, you don't see, this is not one you see really conservatives making against her. They smear her in other ways. Um, it's because the way they view the world, um, it's kind of a, you know, nowadays we're familiar with the every, everything through the lens of race, but there's also like a left-wing lens of uh, class analysis and the more sophisticated left-wingers, it's the capitalist versus the proletariat, but there's a kind of the dumbed down version is, Oh, it's the rich versus the poor, or the haves and the haves not. And they, you know, the, you read Atlas Shrugged, and one of the things you might do if you have that worldview is bring that into question. Is that the right lens to view the world? But if you've never read her and you just hear George Moin, Moinbot say this, um, you know, it kind of, kind of has some positive. Okay, so there's the right way to look at the world is the haves and the have nots. And if you're not in favor of the haves, you must be in favor. Sorry, if you're not in favor of the have nots, you must be in favor of the haves. And if you're re really ex an extremist, then maybe you just don't like the have nots. You want to get rid of them. Um, and she rejects this uh, class based analysis of society, whether it's the sophisticated or pseudo sophisticated Marxist version or the dumbed down have nots haves version. What she cares about um, is whether or not somebody is ambitious and has productive ability. So the poor person working their way through school to have a better life is a far superior, morally superior person to like a trust fund playboy who just inherits money and all he does with it is spend it on parties and, you know, drugs and, and all kinds of things. That kind of person's contemptible. They're rich. And the poor person that I just described is is um, is praiseworthy is and uh, in her novels, we see many current characters who are currently like this. There's um, people toward there's manual labors towards the end. I'm trying not to spoil <laughs> the story. There's manual labors towards the end of Atlas Shrugged who say about their I don't want to just be a truck driver or whatever. I want to do X, Y, Z in the future. 
um, <clears throat> those people she has a very high opinion of. And many of her heroes start life like that. Um, <clears throat> now, there's one spot in which she does, or there's one sequence in her novels in which the some people who are poor are portrayed in a negative light. And that's the um, the scene that takes place in uh, what's called Starnville, Starnsville. Starnsville. And yeah. the, yeah, the residents at Starnsville is a kind of former factory town. There's no work. There's no reason to stay in Starnsville. There's nothing productive going on there. And there's a sort of remnant population that just lives there. And they're not concerned that there's, they could move somewhere else and have a better life. Um, they're, they're just kind of uh, in a downward spiral with no ambition to make their lives better. And it's that that makes them, um, that, that part of their character is why they, why she portrays them negatively, not that they're poor, but that they're poor and just don't care, don't want to do anything about it. And, um, you know, there's other characters that are well, not exactly developed, but mentioned, um, one, uh, uh, uh shopkeeper. Um, again, I'm trying to avoid the spoilers, uh, talks about her parents being poor and like resenting anybody who betters themselves and resenting the rich, the, that kind of, um, person is definitely, uh, there's a negative evaluation of them, but it's not that they're poor that cause That's the reason for the negative evaluation. It's that they're exactly unambitious so, and productive. I'll... Yeah. So she's judging them by criteria that have nothing to do with how much money you have in your wallet, which brings us to the second smear, Ayn Rand glorified the rich. Now you hear that, or again, as Moni would put it, the rich deserve unmediated power. So what would it look like if, what would it look like if Ayn Rand glorified the rich? It would mean that her message is, your goal in life should be to make money. Is it 50 cent? Like, uh, uh, get rich or die trying. That was that would be the message. And yet we see the no. First of all, we we see nonfiction and we look for any evidence of that. We don't find anything. But again, I like to focus on the novels. What do we see in the novels? We see actually, for example, in the Founding Head, Gail Wynan, someone who is very, 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 very rich, but someone who has lost his soul, to put it in, in these terms. So he, he's someone who is profoundly unhappy and he's profoundly unhappy despite being rich and powerful. Why? Because he has some ideas and have some premises that are uh, not uh, contributing to his uh, to having a happy life. Read the, the novel for, for the rest. But also in Atlas Rugged, the obvious example is that most of the villains are rich. So this is not to say anything that she likes or she doesn't like the, the rich. It just already dismisses this idea that she glorifies the rich. If you glorify the rich, how come your villains be rich? But here's something even deeper in her novels. Notice how often we have a character who has a choice to make. And the choice is, I betray my principles, but I get loads of money, or I pass on the loads of money because this means I'm loyal to my principles and on the long term, my principles are important because they're the key to a happy life. And we see that time and again, the heroes in the novels, the heroes of Ayn Rand actually say, I don't care about money if this money will come at the cost of me betraying my principles. There's the iconic scene in the Fountainhead where Rourke, he even had to sell his watch. He had nothing. He was penniless and he gets the opportunity of a lifetime, supposedly, to get a commission to build the, a bank, but to build it in a way that would go against his principles. To put simply, he wouldn't like the building that he would build. And he says, no, you can keep your money. I'm going to go to the quarry. Or in Atlas Rag, we see Hank Reardon, the government, through State Science Institute, coming to him and telling him, name a price. Here's a blank check. Just put a price and give us your great discovery. And Redden says, what do you want it for? And the government says, well, we, we can't tell you. And Redden says, no. And again, they don't do this because they want to be martyrs, but they understand that the, that the key to being happy in life, to, to being successful in the way that Ayn Rand understands success, being successful, 
is not just is is actually to have some values, some goals, some principles, and stick to them. Not as a martyr, but as this being the way to having a good life. So, Mike, putting this together, it doesn't sound to me that Ayn Rand's message is just get rich and uh, you know, it's yay for the rich. No other questions asked. Yeah. So again, the, the if you just sort of run the numbers and count up characters and like, many of the villains are rich, or, uh, many of the villains are rich or there's rich characters who they're not exactly villains, but they're certainly morally tainted um, or at least they're middle class. I mean, a lot of the villains are sort of, um, I guess, academic class types. So they're writers, professors. So that's not rich, but it's also not poor professors make pretty good money, especially if they're leaders. Um, Jim Taggart is one of the wealthiest people in the world, I think, at one point in the novel. Toward, toward literally, the novel. literally one of the wealthiest yeah, people in the world. Literally the, literally the richest or one of the richest. Now, he gets his money through scheming and corruption and deception and theft. And so um, that's morally relevant for Rand. The character Oren Boyle is a sort of... Um, uh, of kind of a, sometimes a foil for Reardon. Reardon is a rich steel magnet who gets his wealth through innovation and creativity. Warren Boyle is a steel magnate who gets his uh, money through uh, political favors and pull. So again, the reason to go into that is not so much to show that the charge isn't true because again, it's a charge that's made without any attempt to justify itself. It's that it's, it, this is a, another, just a classic smear is there's this um, perspective on the world that haves, the have nots, the rich versus the poor that the smear sort of parasites off and then uses to make itself sound plausible. What Rand really is praising is wealth creation or value creation or value achievement, not the mere having or acquisition of wealth, but the creation of it. Um, and it, because from her perspective, I mean, wealth could be acquired through t immoral means, um, you know, uh, an accomplished um, uh, thief or a, uh, a character like Warren Boyle who uses political favors to get wealth. And those are not creative acts. Those are uh, looting in the language of the of the novel. So what she's praising is is, cre is the creation of wealth. And, you know, not all wealth creation is going to make you rich in, in the dollar dollars and cents terms. I mean, think of knowledge production. So somebody like uh, or the physicist Richard Feynman, or uh, just a, a material scientist who does theory nowadays, or or a, um, like a logician or something. These people producing knowledge, making discoveries, they're off very often, or more often than not, not wealthy. They're you know, professor, you know, low six figure salary. That's not a rich person. It's not a you know, poor. Um, but knowledge production is real achievement. Discovering something new about the world is a real achievement, and it's often not. Um, and you're not rewarded with, with dollars. So what she's praising is productive achievement and the productive, um, creation of material wealth is a very important, um, part of life. And one of the reasons, uh, it's, uh, it takes such center stage in her, uh, fiction and, and nonfiction is that almost nobody praises that. You get people who praise knowledge production, but to actually create material values that are that are um, you know valuable for millions of people and 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 then benefiting from that yourself, that's not something that anyone ever praises. So if you have the sort of rich versus poor false view of the world, and then you see Rand praising um, material production, that just looks to you like. Well, yeah, she's praising the rich because you don't have the difference between creation and acquisition. And so <clears throat> uh, I think that's what's going on here. And um, I could easily imagine Ayn Rand praising, let's say, a plumber or a cleaner because 
They take pride in their work and they put their mind on how can I do this work better? How can I, uh, how can I put my mind on making this work, right. this like changing, let's say, the, 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 the environment around me in a way that it becomes closer to what my values are. I and mean, my values would be, let's say, a clean environment, a clean uh, building yeah. or something like that. So it doesn't matter whether you want to study uh, nuclear physics or whether you want to become uh, something which some people might think it's less uh, fancy or luxurious. For and what matters is, do you put your mind on it? Is it something that you find valuable? And do you do, like, it's, it's as people call it, like, do an honest day of work or something like that. Yeah. Shall we proceed to the third myth? So today's going to be a short episode because these myths are so easy to debunk that we're probably going to finish before, uh, before even uh, half an hour. So the third myth is Ayn Rand died penniless and she relied on social security. So this has two parts. One is she died penniless, which is like, haha, you die penniless. And also look the hypocrisy, the person who was talking about uh, free markets and all that stuff and uh, egoism ended up relying to the state because otherwise she would uh, die probably on the streets. So let's see how to, where to start with this. So first of all, the died penniless thing is again, it's arbitrary because there is no record or there is nothing that these people can say. This is why I'm saying that Ayn Rand died penniless. Although sometimes they do the circular argument. She got social security, therefore it probably meant she was penniless. So let's look at some numbers. During her lifetime, Ayn Rand, we know, was a best-selling author. This means that Atlas Rugged and the Founding Head sold millions. Now, think, let's say you get half a dollar for every book sold and you sell millions. I mean, it's probably easy to understand that probably you're not going to be penniless. Even in her nonfiction, The Virtue of Selfishness, while Rand was still alive, sold hundreds of thousands. Therefore, how can you... Already you should doubt this idea that she died penniless. But someone could say, okay, there are many people who get rich and then they lose their money. But from what we know about Ayn Rand, she didn't live a life of uh, excesses and parties and extravagance. So where's the evidence that she died penniless? Or think about it differently. We know that she lived in a nice apartment in the center of New York. We also know that she got at some point in her life the equivalent of the money she got for the rights of the Fountainhead for, for the movie was the equivalent today of more than 800, maybe even $900,000. Again, you put these things together and you wonder how do these people think that Rand could be penniless? It also shows that they probably might not even be that bright if they make such an argument. And last point to make here, last evidence. Without having access to, I don't have access to the numbers and probably they don't matter, but we do know that when Ayn Rand died, she left to Dr. Leonard Peikoff uh, a significant uh, amount of uh, assets that were later, they, they kick-started the Ayn Rand Institute. And we also know that this was an amount of money that actually Dr. Peikoff gave an, a significant amount to the person who was the housekeeper of Ayn Rand as a thank you for her service. So again, how do you put these things together and then think Ayn Rand died penniless. So I think from all the claims, this is the one that merely by Googling, this is, the, again, none of this is inside information. This is like you Google these things. How can you think that Ayn Rand died penniless? But let's get to the second point, Mike, because perhaps this is the most, the, the, the most uh, insidious argument, right? That she got social security, then they make the argument she relied on social security. Therefore, without social security, Ayn Rand would be penniless. Therefore, Ayn Rand was a hypocrite. Therefore, at the end of the day, her ideas don't work. Yeah, so I, I think of these two. So there's the smear that she's penniless. And then the, kind of, to the extent that there is any case made for, for thinking that, it's like, yeah, she took 
Social Security, maybe Medicare. I, I think, again, these are these are smears. So just on the face of it that she died penniless just doesn't make any sense. Even if she'd squandered all her money in her life, that her books are still selling well while well, well, she's alive. So she just have that income anyway. And the 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 claim that sh taking Social Security or something means you're, you know, penniless. I mean, I'm not penniless. And if somebody said, Mike, fill out this form and you get an extra, so you know, six hundred bucks a month or whatever, I do, I do. It's not evidence that I'm broke. It's evidence that yeah, money's money. Give me. Um, so, so there's just no no um, reason to think that this is a real thoughtful criticism. It's just another sphere, a smear, and the smear comes in kind of two flavors. So if somebody emphasizes her taking Social Security benefits, um, usually that's to paint her as a hypocrite, like she opposed social welfare programs, she opposed uh, you know, government, um, government taxation and all that. And now here she is taking it. So that makes her a hypocrite. The penniless smear, the penny, like, if it emphasizes if the smear emphasizes her being supposedly penniless, um, that's more of an attempt to undercut her ethics, I think, because she's telling you, like, follow my life advice and you'll live ha a happier, more successful, um, more enjoyable life. And then you say, yeah, but look at her. She died penniless. Who wants to live that life? Um, so that's what that smear is uh, targeting. So as to the social security side um yeah it's, and the hypocrisy true, let's also say something about the hypocrisy yeah. that yeah yeah uh, how yeah, how yeah, dare so she that. take social security right right so and as far as i know it's yeah it's she did take social security i don't think that's really in dispute but look i mean her view of social security and and all kind of government takings is that they're illegitimate takings they're they're um legalized thefts so your social security tax if you don't want to participate in Social Security, it doesn't matter. They're still going to make you. They're still going to take it out of your paycheck. You get no say in it. Um, and we were pretty sure that she paid into I mean, she had a Social Security card from what I know, and she worked in the United States for decades and decades since uh, she's earning an income in the U.S. for decades after the um, uh, beginning of Social Security. So, I mean, what is the hypocrisy here? If, you, if your car is stolen and the police return it to you, are you a hypocrite for accepting it back because you're opposed to theft? Like that's not hypocritical. And she's opposed to the social security program. She's opposed to other social welfare programs. She still has to pay into them. So the money is taken from her. And then if she has the opportunity to get some of it back, I mean, how is that any different than getting some of your stolen goods back from a, from a regular uh, criminal? So the hypocrite, and I mean, she she wrote about this very issue in an essay, the question of uh, the question of scholarship. If you Google Google that, it's uh, on ARI's uh, website. You can read it, and you know she makes this kind of point. If if you um, if you have the opportunity to uh, take some kind of government benefit, and you view it as this is restitution for what's been taken from me or if you're younger what will be taken from me um, then it's completely legitimate in fact you could I, this goes a little beyond what she says but you could kind of say, like no it's not just legitimate like yeah you probably should do this like this is rested you've been you've been wrong things have been wrongfully taken from you here's an opportunity to get some of it back um <clears throat> now with regard to sometimes you hear that she took medicare whether or not that's true i think is less certain um I, nikos and i don't you know we're not really like ran biographers so um so i'll leave that to people who know better but just assume she did take it i mean again she paid u.s taxes her whole life including she paid taxes after the beginning of the medicare uh medicare programs so it's the same principle this is just a little bit of restitution uh now, the people who um, make the smear are going to disagree with her. That oh, before, sorry, one last question, Mike. Right. Yeah. Am I right that she writes the question of scholarships 
years before the whole issue of whether she will get uh, social security arises. Because someone might say, oh, that was a rationalization. But I'm 99.99% that she rises this way before. So this is a principle that she already explained and that she already had. So because someone might say, oh, this is convenient. No. And she actually said, because I am opposed and I have been vocally opposed to these programs and because I've paid on them, I'm exactly the person who is now, uh, who, who has the legitimacy to say, yes, give me uh, part of what I've already given you. Yeah, so I, I don't know the, or know offhand the exact date that it was published, but it was published in one of her periodicals. And my understanding is that whenever she started taking Social Security was after she stopped publishing her periodicals. So it would have at the very least been a few years before, if not a decade or more before, mm -hmm. um, before that. So, yeah, so it's, it's, um, and it's, not, it's not that it's very important to go into details, but at least from what we get from one biography is that the accountant actually goes to Rand and actually insists, like, Hey, you know, it's not that Rand is like, Oh, where is my social security? Otherwise I cannot uh, cope. Again, that's, it has nothing to do with the principle, but it's an interesting historical detail that uh, sheds even more uh, doubt to this idea that uh, Iran relied uh, on social security. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so on that, this, so the idea that taking social security or Medicaid, Medicare, Medi Medicaid is like evidence that you're broke, I think is um, bizarre. So I heard he said about, you know, getting an extra couple hundred bucks a month, like for most people, most non broke people. Yeah, sure. I just fill out a form and I get my extra money, but even, you know, it, it, on the Medicare issue, I mean, any person, I don't know, in, in middle age or older is probably aware that elderly people are concerned about end of life care and being able to afford it. And even wealthy people are concerned with it. like, I personally know somebody who entered assistant living with a high, with a net worth approaching seven figures who lived long enough that they're out of money. Um, and this is just a common concern that that kind of thing can happen. And that you're thinking of, well, I paid into Medicaid. I can sign up for the benefit. Like, why would that be evidence that you're penniless instead of just evidence that you're being, um, you know, you're covering all your bases, you're being responsible about your end of life situation. And the people who make this charge have to be aware of that. It's not like kids are making this charge. It's supposed scholars and adult historians. So yeah, the reason to go into all this, again, is not to refute the charge because the charge is basically baseless. But to point out that it's an obvious smear once you sort of spell some things out, and I, younger people might not know about end of life financial concerns, so maybe that's news to you. But it's it older the people making this smear know this stuff, and that's just more reason to think that it's a smear, not to, oh I made a mistake. I thought she was broke, but no, I mean there's a there's a value to her estate given in the New York Times obituary for her. Right. So, so if you can, if you really were doing scholarship, you could look at that and see that you're wrong and not make the charge. Yeah. And actually, it would be interesting to have maybe someone like Yaron, who understands finance and the economy stuff better. And he could explain to us why the way the, the medical system in the United States is, it makes these expenses so high. Because maybe in a freer system, through some different types of insurance, maybe this wouldn't be such a daunting possibility. But anyway, this is beyond uh, my knowledge or expertise, so I'm just putting it out there. Now, oh, yeah, and here's... Just, just real, real quickly, um, sure. I, I forgot to mention. So if you're interested just more on the state of knowledge and, and of Rand's uh, uh, end-of-life finances and think, thinking more about how this is a smear, um, our ARI senior fellow, Ankar Gatte, wrote something about this a few years ago. So if you Google what gave Ayn Rand the moral right to collect Social Security, you can you know, see some more details uh, in that that article. Yeah, I think it's a 2014 uh, article or something. So yes, Google, yeah, we, Onkar Gatte, Ayn Rand. 
Okay. Yeah. I should have uh, included in the sources, but I apologize. So people, Google is your friend in this case. So here's here's my final word on on this. These uh, these uh, would but these uh, myths annoy me because I see cynicism behind them. There's so many people who read and rant. They get excited with the ideas for the first time in their life. They enter a world where achievement, heroic stuff is possible. And then these people are rushing to tell them, eh, don't bother. You know what? Don't bother. Actually, not only is this a bad person, but you think that these the new possibilities in life are open to you. Actually, what is open to you is uh, tragedy, bankruptcy, dying alone, uh, and things like that. So this is what I really find insidious here. There is this cynicism that tells you, don't bother. Idealism doesn't lead anywhere. Ideas don't lead anywhere. At the end of the day, you're going to be uh, alone and uh, bankrupt. And that's that's what I find uh, particularly annoying. It, it addresses the... It attacks the best in the idealistic people who get inspired by Ayn Rand. Yeah, the, the point of these sort of attacks or smears isn't to inform you, but to intimidate you away from informing yourself. Like that's what's going on with these. Um, and, you know, we, we went over each of them in turn, and it's important to remember that these the reason these are, I'm saying they're smears, it's not just somebody is mistaken and you know misunderstood the historical record or something there's obvious relevant facts which completely undercut the claim but they go unacknowledged or unmentioned or uh, you know so that and that makes them smears and you have to think about why is somebody why do you smear and you smear because you don't want people to take something seriously and in this case you know um it yeah, who would who would want to take seriously somebody who thinks that the poor should all die? Like that's crazy. Who who would think such a thing? Only a crazy person. And there was this review of I think it was a review of Atlas Shrugged back in the in the sixties. Um, I have a I'm not certain enough to attribute it to somebody. I think it was Gore Vidal uh, who claimed that Rand was in favor of poisoning wells, like literally poisoning wells of the poor. <laughs> like it just completely made up. Um, I hope that's right. If 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 I'm misremembering, <laughs> apologies to the memory of Gore Vidal. But um, <clears throat> like that kind of thing is, yeah. So if you think somebody really believes that, why would you bother with their book? Like that's crazy. Um, and that's the that's the effect they're looking for. Don't read it because if you if people if more people read it, then you can't just smear. You have to actually address. And you have to say, yeah, I don't think it's good for you to pursue your own happiness. Which Rand thinks it's good for you to pursue your own happiness. So actually confront what she says. So it, she's, you know, they're saying, look, she advocates a whole way of life. It led her to misery. It led her to hate, you know, hate people and want them to die. And all. Um, so don't bother learning her philosophies. And I, you know, it's important to recognize these things as, smear, as, as smears, especially like if you're, if you're just getting curious about Ayn Rand, just maybe you're reading The Fountainhead or Atlas Shug, just kind of getting the lay of the land. You're going to, especially if you're like, I don't know, 18, 17, 18, 19, young, you're going to encounter someone who's older than you who tries to do this to you. It's just going to happen. And I mean, two things. One is, yeah, it's a smear, so don't let it stop you from reading, uh, reading her. But the other thing is, yeah, now you know something about that person. They don't care about what's good for you. They care about bullying you away from reading things. Um, so that tells you something too. So don't let people get away with that. I mean, even you don't necessarily have to call them out, but register that. Maybe you shouldn't take this person seriously anymore. Um, if that's their yeah. attitude towards, well, towards ideas. That's a, towards that's a good rule. That's a good rule. When someone says something which is so obviously wrong, not only wrong, obviously a lie, on a topic that you know, you should be suspicious and take with a pinch of salt what they say in yeah. other topics because they lose legitimacy. So if you are telling me yeah. that you are a serious intellectual and your line is that Ayn Rand thinks the poor deserve to die, then I'm going to... I'm not saying that necessarily everything else you say is wrong, but I'm going to put everything you say under some serious doubt. Yeah. Anyway. I, some, 
some people kind of just like say things they've heard. Like I had, when I was reading Rand in high school, like I had teachers say that and like, were they like really sinisterly like with, with extreme malice trying to smear? No, probably more like they didn't know what they were talking about and they were just repeating something they heard. But, but that's, that's interesting to know too. So you just say things, you don't care whether or not they're true. Like that's, I guess that's less of a sin than being actively malicious, but it's still like, I learned not to take those teachers seriously anymore. <laughs> so, and I was Also right good there. lesson for us, Mike, right? We should hold ourselves to higher standards. Like let's not talk about things that we don't know. Like people, you're not going to hear me talk about, I don't know, like uh, Kant's philosophy. I, I don't know about that stuff. So let's be more careful on things that we don't know so that then we don't end up <laughs> Sound, sounding like uh, these people. So at least in your DLF, you see people who talk about things that at least they try to have a good grasp on. That's why, again, different people discuss different topics. So let's yeah, keep this relatively don't short. On so that... you don't, don't Sorry? pontificate on things you don't understand is a good, a good rule to follow. Yeah. That's a, that's that's the final takeaway. So I like this episode being relatively short so people can share it. Again, whenever you hear someone uh, saying these myths, again, it's, it is worth if don't go out of your way, like don't put yourself in a difficult situation. But now we have all the ammunition to show these people that these are just smears. So if you appreciate today's episode, obviously subscribe, like, share, particularly on this one because we address these things that are uh, we've been hearing for ages. So also, uh, if you have other topics you want us to cover, already I saw on Twitter some people suggesting other myths that you want us to address in the future or other uh, uh, scenes from the novels that uh, are uh, controversial or people have uh, misunderstandings about. Drop us an email at newideal at einrand.org. Also remember that every now and then, and Mike knows that because he's leading them, we are doing a technic a specific Q&A episodes addressing a, a objectivist philosophy questions. So for the Q&A episodes, you can drop us an email at experts at einrand.org. Mike, thank you very much. Many thanks, thanks to our viewers. All the best.